Rector of St. Matthew's here in Fairbanks, Alaska. So glad you have joined us, and I'm really grateful that Bishop Mark Latine, the eighth bishop of the Diocese of Alaska, has joined me for a little bit of conversation. What I'm wondering about today, Bishop, first is if you would start us with prayer. Sure, oh, absolutely. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we bless you for the gift of the gospel, the good news that is in our hearts and enlivens us. And we just ask that you give us a spirit of hospitality and grace to share it in any way that in any way that we are called to with those we love. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, thank you. You know what I've been kind of wondering about today is the E word. Oh, no, which no, isn't Episcopalian, it is evangelism. <laughs> and it's something that I think in Episcopal circles we kind of take a step back when we think about that. Some people have said to me, you know, I'm not a stand on the corner kind of Christian and yelling out to people to read the Bible or turn and repent. And they wonder about how they might um, practice their faith tradition in a way that doesn't mean they have to stand out on the street corner. What do you think about evangelism and Episcopalians? <laughs> Yeah, that's true. All the all the all the jokes and the usual sort of um, metaphors about Episcopalians and being the frozen chosen and all of that apply. Um, and part of that is it, it's interesting. Then we come out of a period of history, last hundred years, I think, where evangelism has been defined as people sort of being maybe I might say the sort of in your face evangelism. Um, and uh, sometimes it can be rather, um, it can be rather sort of uh, Pentecostal, and that makes some folks uncomfortable. Um, and we don't feel we're equipped to do it. You know, that's the other thing. I think oftentimes we just don't feel we're quiet about our faith and um, modest, perhaps, about our faith. And so I, I get that. And I oftentimes reflect about what was evangelism like say this, what was evangelism like in Jesus' time, right? I mean, he didn't really get in people's faces either, right? He gathered folks together. He, um, he welcomed people into his midst without stating his agenda. Um, his, his manner was, as I sort of understand it, attraction um, and not promotion. Um, so, I, I like to think of it that way. How do we share, uh, how do we attract people to things that we care about, right? I know that people who share a passion for quilting or for knitting or for baking or for hunting or for any manner of uh, athletic activities have no problem sort of welcoming and inviting people to join them in those activities. And not everybody's gonna, not everybody's gonna get excited about that. And I think that's probably a good way to look at how we can do evangelism. It's, it's not a call to stand on a street corner and preach, um, uh, unless of course you feel that you're called to do that. Uh, but most of us aren't. But most of us really do love the gospel. Most of us really do call. Um, call upon our faith in, in Jesus' love as something that strengthens us. Um, and most of us really love our church and our experience uh, of, of coming to church. And so how do we quietly welcome a friend to come with us? So sort of how do we live our lives? And, uh, and are we living our lives in such a way that that shows the truth of the gospel? Somebody told or I read somewhere I think that um, someone said if you were the only Bible that someone read what would they know about the gospel right. what would they know about Jesus and so that really is about how we live and so are you thinking that it's um, it is the small things like inviting someone to church or offering to pray with someone you know that's a I think that offering to pray with someone is a, a really good one uh, now, obviously, it, it's a little 
different for some you know, for, for you and I because people expect us to talk about prayer. But I know that I know that people who are not ordained um, and just looking at Facebook, people will ask for prayers. You know, people are asking for prayers, and oftentimes people will respond by saying, "We're praying. You know, I'll, I'll pray for you," or, or "Prayers ascending." But you know, a friend of mine. Um, Bishop Lambert uh, taught me something very early on, and that is he was the kind of person who said, if somebody asks you for prayer, well, then pray for them. Just write that in there. Don't say, I will pray for you. Say, hey, well, let me just say a prayer for you right now. And just very quietly say, you know, God, I ask that you hear the prayers of this person and, and, and be present in their need. Something that simple. Um, and, and, and that's, I think, really effective evangelism. Because we all can do that, right? I mean, we yeah, don't have to be professional that. prayers. That's and right. I think that's another thing that might be a little bit harder for Episcopalians because we have our beautiful Book of Common Prayer with just amazing prayers in it that sometimes we don't get used to that being able just to say, Dear God, be with my friend in their pain. And knowing that whatever we say is enough. That's right. And is heard by God. That's exactly right. Exactly right. And and, and you know God gives us God God gives us the words we pray, um, but fortunately God also knows the words that we need to pray or that we that we are praying even if they come out sideways. And maybe even knows the words that we can't figure out how to say. That's right. That's right. Maybe knows what's in our hearts or what's in the voice of the friend who's asked us to offer those prayers. Right. And and you know I think that's all really powerful evangelism. You know, when a person asks you for prayer, you say, yeah, all right, I'll pray with you right now. Um, or when somebody, when you have the opportunity um, to say, what are you going to be doing this weekend? You know, to say, hey, you know what, I, I always like to go to St. Matthew's um, to worship. And um, hey, you want to come with me? I'd love to show you, you know, I'll pick you up. And chances are your friend's going to say, um, yeah. I wonder if, if prayer also is in more, even more subtle ways. Like, is it prayer when we sing? Or is it prayer when we notice the beautiful uh, flowers that have been planted and grown? Or we notice that our pea has come to fruition that we've planted in our herb garden and, and recognizing that those come all from creation, all from our gift of God. And I wonder if those are more subtle ways as, as people hear us express appreciation for grown-up peas or potatoes. Is that also prayer? You know what, Betty? I think that it's all, I think it's all prayer. I think that prayer ultimately is is not what we say or what we do. Prayer is ultimately when we recognize what God is doing for us. Exactly, I think that's true. And making and saying that out loud helps other people to hear that those are things to be grateful for and are other ways of praying too. But music, especially, I think singing um, is another way to pray. It's a wonderful prayer. You know, the, uh, I, I like the concept of the idea that says prayer at its best is attending to a conversation that God has started. Mm. Prayer is not a conversation I start with God. Prayer is actually responding to the conversation that God has started with me before I was even born. And some of the ways we respond to that conversation is just with the joy of singing, you know, or just with the simplest prayer I can think of, which is, Amen. Or an even better one I like is, thank you. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. And I think the other thing to recognize is that we're able to do this kind of um, more subtle evangelism and praying wherever we are. It certainly isn't um, only at church, or only in the herb garden, or only in the choir stalls. It's wherever we are, we're able to show by how we live whose we are. Yeah. 
And I think that when we get down to it, I mean, there, there's so many levels of prayer. The, the individual ones, we don't oftentimes struggle too much with. Oh, there's some of the stuff that we struggle with. We can talk some time about, you know, what do we do when we're angry or frustrated or, you know, how, do, how does prayer sort of inform all of that? Um, but I think it's absolutely valid and true when a person says, gee, I, I feel closest to God when I'm beholding the glory of God's creation out on the trail or at the top of a mountain. And, and I think that's absolutely uh, valid because um, I've experienced that myself. You know, you know, I, I like praying from the cockpit of an airplane. Mm -hmm. you know? but, but that can't be all. I mean, we also, I think, we also need to pray in community. We need to understand that our prayers are part of the prayers of the conversation that God is having with, with all people. And where do we fit in? How do we join with others in that conversation? And I think that's the, val that's the value of why we come to church. I mean, if I'm having a conversation with God, it's going to always go my way, right? Where it's always going to be focused on me. My thank yous are always going to be just that. They're going to be my thank yous. But if I have to join with others and sort of be part of where they're coming from, that's going to expand my understanding of God. It's going to expand my conversation because then I'm going to have to I'm going to have to struggle and come to terms with what may be my blessings in the midst of your sufferings mm -hmm. or vice versa, and and that's why it's it's not enough to just retreat off to our in, in, into our own world. Um, we are called to be a body, a community at prayer. And so that's another reason to invite people to come along. I'll pray for you, but you know what? Come with me to church on Sunday and, 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 and let's, let's pray with others. Um, it's, it's a simple invitation. I think that's right. It, it reminds me also that, you know, those mountaintop experiences are just so wonderful and and even scripturally, they you know they want to stay on the mountaintop, but that's not I think where we are called to be. Yeah. I think we're called to be in the midst of community, and so sort of figuring out how we have some kind of balance between the most wonderful kind of mountaintop experiences that I think all of us have had, um, but then also how we maintain um, our humanity and our faith and as we live out day to day. It's really important, and I think that you're right that we do that in community. I think as Christians, we're not called to solitary very often. Not many of us, anyway. Um, yeah. That we're really called to community. That's right, and some are right. There, mm -hmm. there, there are people mm -hmm. who that's what they're called to do. But you know what? Even those who are called to solitary remain connected to a community. If you think about the mothers and fathers of the desert, you know, of the, of the early. Christian experience, people would go to them um, to share and to uh, and to receive some sense of spiritual connection that they could come back to. Um, so, it, it, you know, ultimately, it's 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 always about the whole. That's right. Well, thank you so You're much welcome. for this conversation. Good conversation. I hope that um, you will enjoy this. We will post um, how you can find other conversations with the bishop, and we will continue these as we can. Betty, I'm going to jump in though before we go. Just I, I know we have enough because um, I guess maybe I'm feeling called in this evangelical spirit though. To just to, I want to encourage you, particularly in this area. Um, I know every church wants to grow their their numbers, um, and every church wants to, uh, to, to, to attract new people. Um, and this is how it's done. It's done by connecting uh, newcomers. More newcomers come to church because they've been invited by a friend than because a, a, a priest uh, makes a pastoral call. It's all part of it. I think all it's 85% is it's, what it's a big number. It's, uh, that people come to a church because they're invited by someone else. And, and, and one of the things that work, people, people who study this stuff, one, thing, one of the things that's at work there is that 
if you're a newcomer and you're entering into a church, um, it is nice to have a person you can recognize and sit next to. Um, you know, we don't, we may be all adults, but the experience of, of the cafeteria in junior high school is never far from our hearts. And there's nothing more, I think, intimidating sometimes than walking into the junior high school cafeteria and not knowing who you're going to sit next to. Um, and that stays with us. So invite your friends, invite others, um, be a welcoming presence. Uh, and um, that's what I think is really important. And going even one step further is if you, even if we are not the ones who invited the person, if we're in the pews, to be, to, to give radical hospitality to the person that we recognize as newly entering this community, this worshiping community, so that it's not just on the part of a person who has done the inviting to make sure that the newcomer feels welcome, but it's really for all of us. And again, that's about all of us being part of a, a welcoming community yeah. um, and, and walking in that way of love. God bless you. See you soon. Peace.